On CTV News, investigation into the worst hit buildings from the quake and an alcohol ban for one of Christchurch's most popular suburbs. Welcome to CTV News, I'm Rob Cope Williams. The public are now being asked for assistance by the Department of Building and Housing who are investigating the worst hit buildings. The Department of Building and Housing is conducting an investigation into the Canterbury Television, Pine Guild Corporation, Forsyth Bar and Hotel Grand Chancellor buildings. This was announced by the Minister for Building and Construction in March and the department is now asking the public for assistance. It's seeking photographs, video recordings and first-hand accounts of the state or performance of the four buildings prior to, during and after the 22nd of February earthquake. It would like any information by or before the 31st of May. The technical investigation will establish and report on the original design and construction of the buildings, the impact of any alterations, how the buildings performed in the 4th of September quake and the aftershocks, what assessments of the building's stability were made and why the buildings collapsed or suffered serious damage on the 22nd of February. However, it will not address liability. The material will be passed on to engineering experts who are assisting with the investigation. Material can be sent to Canterbury Earthquakes Building Investigation, Department of Building and Housing, PO Box 10729 Wellington. Envelopes should be marked Attention David Kelly, Deputy Chief Executive Building Quality. For more information, call the department on 04 817 4266. There are many people who say that the City Council stopped its liquefaction collection far too soon. CTV News has received a number of calls from upset residents who say the weekend's deadline for liquefaction collection was too soon. One caller said the deadline added to the stress of many residents who'd finished clearing liquefaction from the February quake only to be hit with more after the 5.3 quake on the 19th. Civil Defence announced free collections of silt would end at the end of last week. Jane Parfit, General Manager of City Environment, says the time had come to stop the liquefaction collection. Well, there really has to be a point in time where we have to draw it to a close, um, and that point in time was the end of April. However, having said that, over the next two to three weeks, our um, council contractors will be going out to do a very last clear-up. So we really wanted people to get their requests, and especially elderly people, people without close friends or neighbours, people with disabilities, to put in their requests last week. At the end of the week, we had about 100 outstanding requests, and over the weekend, our volunteers helped us with 40 of them. So we've got about 60 still to do, and we'll be getting out to them in the next couple of weeks. She says people can now take their silt to the Eco Depot for disposal and keep the receipts for insurance claims. And then, after that, if people do still have silt to get rid of, they should take it to the Eco, Eco Depot and make sure that they keep the receipt because that's claimable for insurance purposes. But, she says, there are still measures in place for those unable to get to the Eco Depot. In the case of these sorts of people, I would suggest that they do let us know and our contractors will pick it up. Um, from there. As I said to you, we're hopeful we've got most of them now because we did publicise it that it was coming to an end. But if you really um, are stuck and you've still got some there, 941 is our council um, customer services line and they'll put a request through and the contractors will be out in the streets over the next two to three weeks. The volunteers were to help people such as elderly, those with disabilities or people without personal networks or community support to help with their silt removal. There have been various volunteer groups helping. The volunteers have been from all over. Um, I mean, it would be hard to say one particular place. Um, at the moment the students have gone back to varsity. Of course you know over the, the ten weeks since the earthquake they've just been terrific. We've had the Farmers Army, they've been great. We've had the Red Cross and then we've had just other people who've um, pitched in and helped. Volunteers and those needing volunteer assistance should call the council helpline or email info at ccc.govt.nz. The fire service has been in the middle of the action since February 22 and now it's taking its toll on staff. Uh, there was a lot of shaking, a lot of uh, rattling of the, the station and unfortunately we've, we've sustained quite a bit of damage. 
Uh, in the very initial phases, the crews got the fire trucks out of the, the appliance bay, as we call it, got them outside, and we're in a position to respond to the growing number of calls that started coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our main focus was uh, ensuring that we got our resources out, our people out, and then responding to the various sites around the city that we were becoming aware of very quickly. In the initial phases, everybody's overwhelmed by just the sheer scale, the sheer volume, and I have to take my hat off and give credit to most of my frontline officers who were here at the time who started coordinating and organising the response, the resources coming in, uh, ensuring that people had the right gear. We had all available resources out on the road, and as um, additional managers were flowing in from around the country and, and arrived by road, our first, our first group came in from the southern region, our colleagues down there, and we were able to form what we call an incident management team that began coordinating and getting a structure in place around our resourcing and our response. At Central Station, we sort of divided up into three parts, the East Wing, the Appliance Bay and the West Wing. Our West Wing has slumped and sustained a lot of damage and uh, as such, for safety, safety reasons, we've moved everybody out of that, that part of the building. Uh, we've had to uh, come out of the Appliance Bay and we've got a temporary structure out on the road which is housing three of our trucks. Uh, two of our crews have had to go out to Sockburn and to our St Albans station and we've also got one crew uh, currently located down at New Brighton with our volunteer brigade down there. So it's sort of been a, a real um, upheaval for everybody, moving out, relocating and also reducing our footprint in terms of the available space on station. The majority of our staff are now sleeping in the backpackers next door to us and uh, I've had to um, give up my office, so to speak, and... Um, done so to, to allow my operational staff, the frontline staff, to set up their office, the rostering needs in a, in a safe environment and uh, my management team and support team, we've moved into a portacom and uh, we'll be based out of there. It's, it's demonstrating to everybody uh, that we've had to do a lot of changes, that everybody has to do their bit until we're able to move into new, new buildings. The fire service got good support from out of town and volunteer crews. Yeah, on the uh, day of the quake, yes, we did. We had a lot of um, volunteer stations that came in, made themselves available. Uh, also, all um, crews within the crisis area uh, made themselves available. M- my role at that time was with fire risk management, so um, I put on my gear and, um, and hop- jumped on a truck also and went into the uh, into the CBD. But I think we all got very, very tired and fatigued in those uh, in that initial phase, um, and of course that was necessary. We had a work, we had a job to do. Um, we were in the uh, rescue mode at that stage and there was a great number of people that had to be rescued. So we just continued on working um, as and when we saw fit um, in different areas of Christchurch. Um, but we also have a four shift system so the, um, the guys would come on and replace um, the on duty crews as and when um, the, the rostered shift finished. The recovery mode was quite um, late in the piece, further on down the track, and uh, so the, the, the rostered shift system w- was working reasonably well then, although having said that, um, they did bring in um, uh, appliances from uh, other areas of, of New Zealand. Um, a lot of volunteers also came over from as far as the west coast. Uh, we've had crews from Dunedin come up and um, certainly assist, so that's been, that's been well appreciated. Because it's our own city, uh, it's been very, very difficult, and a lot of the firefighters um, have uh, damaged or destroyed homes. So they've had to focus purely on on their work um, in those uh, those early um, stages. And now, because they've got now time to reflect on on their damage and what's been happening for them, that has um, caused some issues as well for them. We have a welfare plan here in, in Christchurch, um, and it's quite a comprehensive plan. So we're monitoring the the firefighters and their families, um, supporting both themselves and their families. Uh, We have a a range of psych services that we have set up. Um, uh, We've linked in with the police and and their welfare plan and um, working together there. Uh, And we also have firefighters who have come over from their normal operational role to assist in welfare. So there is a team of us and um, we're having meetings with with families. We're we're organising meetings with... um, insurance companies as well um, and representatives from EQC just to try and give them some idea of of, um, what's happening for them. Coming up after the break, an alcohol ban will be enforced in suburbs that have seen an influx in customers and survival kits for the Neonatal Trust of New Zealand. Welcome 
come back, an alcohol ban will be enforced in suburbs that have seen an influx in customers looking for a new place to drink. A report to last week's City Council meeting recommended an alcohol ban in public spaces in Rickerton and Islam for six months. And investigations are now looking into bans in Papua Nui and Miravale. People are now banned from consuming and possessing alcohol on streets and other public spaces. Police and the Rickerton Wigram Community Board want the ban to stop alcohol-fueled trouble in the suburbs since the quake. These suburbs have reported an influx of bar customers since the February earthquake. There are particular problems in the Rickerton, Islam, of Papua Nui and Miraval areas. These suburbs have become the focus of weekend socialising that previously happened in the central city. So post the earthquake, there seems to be a lot more disorder and certainly the police record that. And there seems to be disorder around parties in the Rickerton Islam area, which wasn't such a feature before. Basically, the problems before were when young people were at the pubs and walking home. And on top of that now, we've got parties largely by students, possibly other young people, and those parties are spilling over onto the street. Councillor Broughton said she and many residents wanted a permanent public alcohol ban for several years. Well, I think we'll probably have to have a liquor ban uh, around university. Whether we have to have it as broad as it is, I don't know. And potentially once the strip goes back into operation, and that's back on the 29th of October, it may be that we don't have the same problems. So it's very much a testing time, I would say, and I guess it's going to be the results. But I'm really convinced there will have to be an area of Rickerton Island which has a permanent liquor ban. There's been an area, a confined area, there's been a lot of problems since 2004. And I and residents have tried to get a much more confined area as a liquor ban since that date. And the, the residents have actually gone to two working parties at council, one in 2004, one in 2007, and one in 2010, I should say, and have actually not succeeded well. What happened in 2010 is the council decided to put in a liquor ban in this more confined area in a temporary basis, and it commenced on the 17th of February and it only ran for five days before the earthquake. So that more confined area was tested and from anecdotal comments from residents it seemed to be much quieter. And my belief is that probably it would be students in this area were fully briefed and therefore they didn't have to be stopped by the police, they just knew what the rules were and complied. She says evidence from a temporary ban during this year's Canterbury University orientation, which was interrupted five days in by the quake, showed fewer people drank in public places. I think it's a positive step. I'm surprised at the scale of it. It's stretching now from Blenheim Road through to Fendleton, Deans Avenue through to Pierce Street. So it's a much larger scale than I had ever advocated for and that large area has been proposed by the police. So, so there's an irony in this. Police say main problems were people moving between suburban bars when it would usually only happen in town. As the strip is closed, and I think it's really unfortunate because I actually think young people should have a place to go, um, they've come down to Rickerton, probably to in fact Miravale, and they're having that same nightlife, or trying to, which they had, had on the strip. Now... I personally think they are entitled to a nightlife, but the trouble with Rickerton is that you've got a residential area close to the bars, and they are probably spilling out onto the street and probably walking home late at night and causing problems. Councillor Broughton says she does believe there is a need for a place for young people to go. I mean, I'm really sympathetic to the fact that young people have to have a place to go and they have to have some bars and restaurants, and they have to try and have a good time. So all this liquor ban is doing is stopping drinking on the streets. It won't confine their sort of fun at the bars, it won't confine them to being a stayed or anything like that, but it is going to stop drinking on the streets. All suburban bars have seen an increase in patronage, although some say they've not experienced the same drunken problems as bars in Rickerton and Miravale. Yeah, no, we've um, yeah we've been 
pretty pretty busy, yep. It's definitely increased, that's for sure. Bill says they have seen an increase in people staying around longer when they were usually move into town. Yeah, they are sticking on a little bit later. We've never been a real late bar, but they are there a bit later now. Bill thinks there should be a total wide liquor ban, as there have been other suburban areas that have been having issues, as well as Rickerton. The council will also debate a motion tabled by City Councillor Aaron Kewan, who's calling for a one-year liquor ban for all of Christchurch City and Banks Peninsula. The council is likely to consider the notice at its next meeting on April the 28th. The liquor ban will be in place from May the 19th. Parents of premature babies can be faced with specific challenges. The Neonatal Trust of New Zealand has put together a number of survival kits to help. Um, the Neonatal Trust have been fantastic. Um, they've really helped um, me and my daughter Grace when we had to be flown up to um, Wellington um, after the earthquake. Um, went up there, had never been to Wellington before with my 80 year old grandmother. Um, and we got flown up um, in one of the small aeroplanes to um, be in the hospital up there because of, she was an incubator. So, um, and on life support sort of thing with oxygen, and um, so we had to get flown up there. When I arrived there, um, they greeted us at the hospital with food and um, just um, some lovely clothes and um, anything that we could have, like um, just lotions and things to make you feel welcome. Um, And so, yeah, they were just fantastic. Um, Grace was born on the 28th of January. Um, She was born very premature, 25 weeks, five days, um, which was pretty crazy for us. Um, She survived the first earthquake, even I fell down the stairs with her in that, so I ended up getting 12 stitches on my leg, but she survived that, so she survived two major earthquakes. She does suffer from chronic lung disease, um, which is quite um, common in prem babies, Um, but other than that, she's like pretty pretty healthy, just needs to start feeding now, so she's chew fed, so she just lays there and likes just getting fed, not woken, so it's just getting her into a, a habit of a normal baby of feeding and all those sort of things, so... Yeah, other than that, she's been really good. A presentation of the first survival kit took place in Christchurch. Michael Meads explains. Um, I was actually down here in Christchurch on the day of the earthquake, um, setting up the Neonatal Trust Canterbury. Um, And as a result of the earthquake, uh, we had to delay the meeting. The earthquake showed up serious shortages for premature baby needs. So people were left without formula, nappies... um, heating, um, ways to, to heat baby milk. Um, so when I got back to Wellington and a couple of days later, I then reflected upon the earthquake and thought to myself, people aren't really prepared. They might have their survival, um, their survival kits for their families, but they have nothing specific for neonatal graduates. Um, and so we put these kits together um, uh, with um, the support of New Zealand Communities Trust who gave us $15,000. Each kit's worth $500. Um, so in, in these kits there's, there's various things like formula, nappies, um, blankets, um, lanterns, uh, cookers, um, very, very specific to babies' needs. So a, a lot of the stuff actually came from Christchurch and I was able to happily write a check out to the businesses down there or, or down here in Christchurch, um, which made me feel as I was doing something for Christchurch as well, not just um, Christchurch neonatal graduates. Today's presentation was a milestone. It's never been done before. So um, Canterbury, you're a first. Coming up after the break, we take a look at some interviews from CTV's City Life programme. Welcome back. With the state of emergency lifted, coordination of the recovery passes to the Christchurch Earthquake Authority. The Minister for Earthquake Recovery, Jerry Brownlee, spoke to Kenita Knight on CTV's City Life. Well, I think the first thing is that the Christchurch City Council remains a collaborating partner with SERA, which is very, very important. Uh, so you have your normal networks through the community boards and, and councillors. Uh, it's my intention that there will be regular briefings, uh, discussions um, with uh, elected members of the, the local authority, um, as well as the establishment of a community forum, mm-hmm. which will be for non-elected uh, leaders in our community who uh, have you know, assumed a representative role 
um, or have uh, a, a direct representative role uh, for either organisations or just neighbourhood communities. So tell us more about this forum. How can people actually get involved with this? Uh, look, they can uh, get on the uh, uh, CERA website. Um, they can phone my office. They can do a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're asking is for either individuals or community organisations to nominate uh, for appointment to that group. So it'll be at least 20. I suspect it'll be uh, somewhat larger than that. Uh, but it's, it'll be a two-way dialogue about you know what's happening uh, how the recovery plans coming together? I should talk about those, I suppose. And um, uh, you know, what do we need to know about what's happening on the ground in communities? So, how are the recovery plans coming together? Yeah, great question. So, <laughs> uh, one of the the uh, intentions here is that we'll have an overarching strategy put together over the next uh, three months or so, which is going to be just a a broad brush at what we're hoping to achieve. It could be very, very short. We want to make Christchurch. Uh, uh, safer and better than it was prior to uh, the February 22nd event. Mm. But underneath that, you're going to have to have a lot of plans for uh, various types of recovery. So tomorrow we announce um, uh, the full details of, a, of an alliance between uh, contractors, uh, the council, CERA, uh, etc., uh, for the rebuild of the infrastructure throughout the city. So we've got very damaged roads. You don't have to go um, you know, too far down any street to find a little bit of damage. Mm. Um, then there will be, for example, the eastern suburbs will need recovery plans, probably individually. Uh, business recovery will be something that we need to plan for and work out how we do that. Uh, the Christchurch City Council will be leading the uh, CBD recovery. They've got uh, a nine-month window to put together a plan for what the new CBD could look like, um, should look like. So it'll, it'll have all the parameters for what people can do uh, building-wise. We want to have a, you know, Bob Parker's got some great ideas uh, but we want essentially to see something that allows people to do things without going through uh, you know, massive uh, hoops. It's going to take at least that time to clear that central city out because of the large number of damaged buildings. Mm. Uh, it will also have um, you know, plans for um, you know, how we get the sort of social cohesion back into communities, particularly where there are some uh, you know, decisions, I think, that are going to be um, you know, pretty, pretty serious for the eastern suburbs. Mm. Uh, we want to have that as quickly as possible, but uh, Sarah is gathering uh, alongside EQC as much uh, good, solid information as possible so that we can make decisions that people can be uh, confident with. And Mayor Bob Parker explains what part the City Council are taking in the City's restoration. In, the, uh, in this sort of period we're in, the emergency comes to an end and the new uh, Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority takes over the role of the uh, civil defence organisation and both of these organisations are, are largely funded by uh, sorry, largely uh, staffed by staff from the Christchurch City Council which means we do fund a portion of that mm. uh, but also it brings in a layer of expertise from a number of other areas and uh, it's part of a big step forward from really that immediate recovery phase starting to morph now into beginning to look at how we rebuild mm -hmm. so Sarah's role is to be a conduit between local government. Uh, I, I like to look at it this way. We are the only council in New Zealand now that has its own dedicated government department and a direct route to cabinet, which means really a direct route for funding for our city. So it's a big step forward. Uh, we'll be working side by side. We'll hopefully become inseparable, like kind of Chinese and uh, Siamese twins maybe. So it's an exciting time to start shifting the focus. Hmm. So how important is Sarah for Christchurch? Well, it's vital. We, we can't rebuild the city without um, taxpayer funds coming in. So if you're going to have taxpayer funding of the scale that we are looking at, and probably $3.5 billion is the first estimate of that sort of a spend, if you're going to bring together lots and lots of government departments into a cohesive body to work with the city, then the Sarah model is the most appropriate model in my view. It's a short cut it offers a, a single leadership platform. One of the problems I think we had with the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Commission, or CERC, because all these names get really confusing, was it was a more of a diffused leadership model. This one gives us a single structure that works alongside council, has ultimate authority in a number of important areas, and so it's vital for the city we have a good relationship. How are, how's the council looking after people in Christchurch? I mean, there was a lot of flack in regard to the eastern suburbs. 
How are people being looked after them now? Have, have they become more important, I suppose? Well, I think they always were probably the most important group in the city. And I think we need to, first of all, define what is the East. Now, in the first earthquake, the East was definitely Avonside, Bexley, areas that were quite clearly devastated by the earthquake. And this time, it's much bigger. It's really Littleton, right over the hills, all the uh, seaside suburbs, and then right around to uh, probably St. Martin's and to the Opawa area, uh, Huntsbury, those sorts of places. And then everything east of Hagley Park, effectively, uh, right out into the northeast of the city. It's a massive area. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about a third of the city now. So I, I think that it was a struggle for civil defence in the early days when there wasn't uh, enough equipment on the ground to give everybody the level of service we wanted. But I think uh, uh, anyone who was reasonable would say that it's been an absolutely immense logistical exercise, 30,000 chemical loos, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of repairs to get water back to every single household in the area. Same with the electricity. We have done a huge amount of repair work on the roads. And of course, you know, the, the repairs are temporary repairs. It's, it's lash-ups in a sense to get things working. And that's the beginning of the shift that we make now from the sort of lash up, get it working, get it fixed, make life as good as you can in the circumstances to beginning to move through to the real repair phase. And that means planning for the central city area inside the four avenues, a massive project the council will lead and involve, I hope, everybody in our city who wants to be involved. And also at the same time we begin the planning for the rebuild of the suburban areas which have been devastated and some of those wonderful suburban uh, centres, shopping centres too that have received a lot of damage. You know, Littleton's one great example but there are many many others across the city and we want to work with our communities to uh, try to come through this terrible uh, event with something even better than we started with. And that's CTV News, I'm Rob Cope Williams. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.